Well, good morning and welcome to today's CEDA live stream uh, discussion of the recently released review report uh, on the Reserve Bank of Australia. I'm Melinda Salento, the Chief Executive of CEDA, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia. Um, and it's really a, a great pleasure to have you joining us for what I think is going to be a pretty interesting and full conversation today. Can I, of course, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners on the lands in which we're all joining this call from? Um, I'm here on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects uh, to elders to past, present and emerging. Um, in doing so, I would also just like to acknowledge that CEDA is a supporter of a voice uh, to Parliament. Well, as I said, it's very uh, clearly um, a lot of interest in the RBA review panel's report, uh, which was released last week. Um, we would love nothing more than for our audience to be involved in today's conversation, which of course you can uh, do by um, joining us on social media, but also in, in the context of the conversation today, you can post your own questions and vote on questions of others um, through our Pigeonhole uh, app. Um, details are there on the screen before you. Um, please jump in early, put your questions in and vote on others so that as we get to that Q&A part of our conversation, um, you, can, you can ask your own questions and uh, get the answers to the issues most important to you. Um, I think everyone is, uh, who's joining this live stream is well aware of the intense scrutiny that's been uh, on the Reserve Bank and its leadership team, particularly over the last two years or so. Um, the review report, which we're going to discuss today, of course, was a commitment from the um, opposition at the time prior to the election um, and has been uh, implemented since um, the Labor government uh, was elected and we've now got the report before us. Uh, joining us to share their insights on their thinking um, and their recommendations in the review are the review panel themselves, uh, Dr Gordon de Brouwer, who's Secretary of the Public Sector um, Reform, Professor Renee Fry McGibbon, who is from the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University, and Professor Carolyn Wilkins, who's a member of the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Welcome all. Um, just in terms of proceedings for today, I thought what we would do is, is run through a couple of high level questions with the panel to help them frame their recommendations and their thinking. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, we're going to open for Q&A with you, the audience. Um, so let's kick off with some, some of these questions. Uh, and as I said, please get your questions uh, into Pigeonhole. But um, to start us off, perhaps, Gordon, if I could... Um, uh, go to you first. Um, the review made a number of observations about um, the RBA's performance uh, over the last decade or so, decades or so, um, and obviously that's framed the, the recommendations. You're uh, thinking about how the RBA has performed and and how uh, you could contribute to better outcomes in the future. So, just wondering if you could kick us off by sort of outlining some of the key messages from the report on on the RBA's performance. Thanks. Over to you, Gordon. Uh, th thanks very much, Melinda, and uh, I'm delighted to be here on Nunna Law Country. So uh, our intention in looking at performance was really to inform what sort of bank, what sort of framework is necessary, and what sort of decision making is important for, for the RBA to be strong and, and fit for purpose in the future. We looked over the past uh, 30 years. Uh, we had a lot of uh, conversations and listening to people, so I'd say a thousand and a half people that we engaged with. We had full access to the relevant RBA board papers and internal uh, internal RBA notes. And we had the, the very strong support of the, the governor and the, and the board in, in doing that. So we're, we're very grateful for that. I think when we look overall over the 30 years, uh, Australia's performance, macro performance has been very strong. And one of the big parts of that is an independent central bank that has a forward-looking and flexible inflation target. And we were struck by the success of the 2 to 3% uh, flexible in inflation target. In our conversations with people, um, more recently, three episodes have been of particular interest. There was the 2016 to 19 period. And the thing that we took from that, when inflation was below target and unemployment was a bit higher, the, the lessons we learned or took from listening to people and, and our own analysis was just how important it is that the thinking 
behind monetary policy decisions is well explained, that the arguments are, are explored publicly uh, and alternatives and trade-offs set out. That's one, one, one element. The other is uh, the, the need for a greater clarity about the role of financial stability uh, in monetary policy decision-making and what's the role of economic prosperity and welfare as an objective of monetary policy. That, that's, what, that's what that episode uh, highlighted. The, the second episode was the pandemic and, and the use of additional monetary policy tools like forward guidance, the yield target, term funding facility, bond purchase program. I think we were struck that the, the board's response in March 2020 uh, was an essential part of the economic response to the pandemic at a time of extreme uncertainty, both socially and, and economically. Yet, each of these tools experienced some significant difficulties and had processed shortcomings in terms of either what the information available to the board was or how the board was involved in decision making. So as an example, the, the, the yield target, uh, the, the, there were the opportunities or that was extended at various times without the board being involved. Uh, there was a discussion in the middle of 2021 uh, around uh, as the overnight uh, interbank swap market deviated from bond yields, whether that was an appropriate time to exit from the, the yield target. Uh, and, and that what that wasn't taken to the board and the exit that occurred over October, November, the board wasn't involved in uh, when, when, it, when it should have been. But each of the other um, instruments as well have either information shortcomings in what was presented to the board or the board not being involved in key aspects of decision-making. So what do we take from that period? Uh, it really is the value of expertise in financial markets and systems in decision-making. So what sort of expertise and insight do you need? The really important thing of the time for the time for debate and time for active debate to test ideas in the design of planning of monetary policy tools, including planning for events to turn out differently from what people expected. And when you've got a variety of instruments, how those instruments interact and how do you, how do you exit from those particular instruments. Uh, carefully consider, considering how to best to communicate the, the intention of policy so that the messages that people intend are, are effectively relayed. Uh, and, and then also the potential value of analysis and modelling of, of fiscal policy interactions with monetary policy. Uh, and doing that more generally, not just within government, but within universities and think tanks. So there's a lot, lot of things that informed our thinking around the framework and around decision making uh, for the future. Finally, the last episode was the more recent high inflation, the 2022-23. Uh, it initially slow to react and, and that episode is still unfolding. But early lessons that we can take from that are the value of expertise in understanding the supply side of the economy in both decision making and analysis. Again, uh, the importance of new data sets and the modeling and analysis of the supply side, but more generally drawing in other, other insights from other people. But also the, the, just the need for time and active debate to test uh, long established assumptions uh, about what the nature of the economic process is. So it's a reflection on the past, Melinda, that's designed to in inform where we want the bank to be in the future. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. I think that's really helpful. And the, I know the report sort of looked at these three sort of periods, but I think it's really great the way you've sort of tracked through and sort of explained some of the key lessons from each of those. Obviously, you know, one of the, the key recommendations that ca that's come out through the review is the separation of, um, of sort of responsibilities, if, if you like, and this creation of, of two boards, um, the, the monetary policy decision-making board, if you like, and then the, the sort of corporate governance uh, board. Um, that's my angle into to welcome you into the conversation, Carolyn, to, to um, ask you for your sort of um, perspectives and sort of explanation, if you like, around the rationale behind these recommendations, the separation of those, those two roles and, and what it means. So thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, Melinda. It's It's been a real privilege and an honour to have been, as the only non-Australian, be part of this uh, external review of the RBA. And I can just say right up front that, that uh, it's clear from the feedback from our consultations 
of which there were many, Gordon talked about it, that the RBA is a strong and, and very widely respected institution. I saw that firsthand internationally with uh, about 20 years of central bank experience uh, and the contribution of the RBA has always been uh, first class. So, so where we came out on the governance side was really informed by, by um, the feedback that we received, but also the advice from experts uh, that we had asked for written advice, uh, as well as international practices. And we saw an opportunity uh, for the RBA to really build on its strengths and to improve its governance in, in two areas. Um, the first area is just stronger monetary policy decision-making and accountability. Uh, as Gordon said, there's no doubt that the that the overall the RBA has done extremely well in meeting its objectives set out for monetary policy. And you know, there's no doubt that the current board is very able and very dedicated. What our recommendations aim to do is really better enable board members to shape policy decisions and shape the strategy around those decisions and the underlying analysis and judgments that support that. We also wanted to strengthen the transparency and the, the accountability, which is just so important around monetary policy decision making. Now, these objectives were always important, but I think they're even more important as we go forward because we're operating in what is an increasingly complex environment that includes more supply side shocks, broader monetary policy toolkit. And so that's what led us uh, to have a couple of main recommendations in this area. And the, the first is that the government should form a monetary policy board with greater economic expertise and greater participation in decision-making while at the same time maintaining diverse perspectives and knowledge. We're not saying that the board needs to be stacked with PhD economists, uh, far from that. You can see that from the skills matrix that we've put up uh, in the report. We think the monetary policy board should move to eight monetary policy meetings a year from the current 11. It's really a question of, of the time to have that full and frank discussion that, uh, that Gordon talked about in terms of just not having happened you know, I've been part of a monetary policy board, a financial policy committee, where there needs to be time to consider the issues, to ask for subsequent analysis, to receive it, engage with the staff directly uh, during each meeting cycle. And when you do that, the, the staff would have time to produce a richer set of brief, briefing materials on strategy, on policy options, the costs and benefits of these options. And I think that it's not just a on paper governance change, it really is linked to, um, to the internal culture of the bank as well, because uh, you know an expert group of decision makers that are engaging in deeper consideration of the issues, uh, interacting more with staff, well, it's gonna increase the demand for analysis and fundamental research and, and, and probably even increase the amount of debate. Um, the monetary policies should be more transparent. And so we're recommending press conferences after each meeting, uh, that the documents that support the decision-making are published after five years, and that board members themselves have a voice, not necessarily in speeches, possibly, but also in uh, you know, uh, working in the community, going to visit different communities that the RBA serves. This is a model that other central banks use for their uh, internal and external members of decision-making committees. And then finally, on this area, they should, uh, RBA could strengthen its uh, strategic communications capability with a new chief communications officer position. Uh, communications are just so difficult as, as it gets more complex, but also the environment for getting messages out is becoming more complex. The second area is with respect to corporate governance. And, and right now, as many of you know, the responsibility for the RBA is heavily concentrated with the governor, especially on the governance side. And the Reserve Bank intentionally pays very limited uh, role in the oversight of uh, outside of monetary policy. Now, these arrangements are very far behind good practice internationally. And so our recommendations are really just to strengthen the co corporate governance by establishing um, an RBA governance board with an external chair, that's very common practice. Uh, they would support and oversee management uh, and the government's role could include the oversight of the RBA's organizational strategy, their finances, um, 
strategic staff planning, which is a really big deal for every big organization, um, and risk management, including risk management. Uh, it shouldn't have any role in the policy, like monetary policy payments. There's other boards to do that, so it will be important to set out those expectations clearly. Uh, we did consider carefully whether two boards were actually needed. That was, you know, it needs legislation. It means costs, especially in the transition. And so we're very conscious of that. Um, clearly, two boards would clarify and increase accountability. But more than that, what we weighed really highly was the benefits of bringing outside expertise and knowledge to bear on issues of organizational management, which are just so important. There's many central banks, it's not just the RBA, the executive group is relatively homogeneous in terms of experience and knowledge, particularly on the corporate side. And so a corporate board could uh, draw on that kind of knowledge, people from the, from the community in areas like technology, HR, uh, financial reporting, again, I'll go back to cyber. And that going forward would increase the RBA's capacity to adapt to future challenges and uh, with respect to people, technology and cyber. The other thing that the board uh, we, we think should be responsible for is, is um, overseeing the roadmap to, to implement the changes that, that the government decides needs to be made, need to be made and, um, and to help the, the the RBA executives kind of manage that transition as it as it rolls out. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, a lot in there, and I'm sure more that we'll come back to in in the Q and A, um, including um, that all important word culture, which has no doubt uh, informed some of the other recommendations in the in the review. Um, Renee, um, I can't have you sitting quietly on the benches for <laughs> too much longer. So let's bring you into the conversation as well. Um, a couple of key things I think stand out from, from the review recommendations. Um, firstly, of course, the reaffirmation of the importance of the focus on price stability um, and inflation targeting. Uh, but I think one of the things that maybe hasn't been picked up in the media um, quite as much as you might have expected was just the focus through the, the reporters and the recommendations on the, the role that monetary, play, monetary policy plays working with fiscal policy um, and understanding those two together, uh, but also um, how um, the RBA is involved with um, financial stability more broadly and, and clarifying that. So um, perhaps over to you just to sort of track through some of the, the underlying thinking and considerations that informed uh, the recommendations in those three areas. Great. Thank you so much, Melinda, and thank you for hosting us today. I'm coming uh, to you from the Ngunnawal country here in Canberra. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying that um, we found that the flexible inflation targeting regime was worked really well for Australia over the past 30 years. So we're not recommending any changes to that. Uh, we're recommending that we keep an operationally independent RBA as well. And we really want to recognise the um, high quality and effectiveness of the RBA over the period of time um, that we've been looking at, at them. So we have this really unique opportunity here to update the Reserve Bank Act, which was written in 1959 before we even had like the Australian dollar um, when we had a fixed currency. So a lot of things have changed since then. Um, so we wanted just to really use this opportunity to um, really build on the strengths of the framework that we already have. Um, the principles that we sort of followed when thinking about this were that we were concerned about the welfare of the Australian people as the overarching um, objective. We wanted to learn from the lessons that uh, Gordon has, has gone over. And we also want to make sure that the framework is robust to the future. We don't see that the future is going to be any uh, simpler um, than it has been before the pandemic. Um, we, we're, we seem to be in a different regime, so we want to make sure that um, that, that happens as well. We want to make sure the objectives of the RBA are clear so that they are clear for accountability and decision making. We want them to be achievable using the tools available to the RBA. We want the public to be confident and we want um, there to be flexibility for times when uh, the objectives of the bank are, are in conflict. So 
We, we are recommending that we do open um, the Act. And one of the uh, reasons is just to update the objectives of monetary policy that, that are listed in the Act. So the Act currently sets out three objectives. One is stability of the currency. One is the maintenance of full employment. And another is the economic prosperity and the welfare of the people of Australia. So going through all of this, we thought that it was better if economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia apply to the whole bank, not just to monetary policy. That goes without saying across the whole thing. And we thought that if we could take that out of the initial, uh, the main objective of monetary policy, then um, we can just have, have a little more clarity about what the bank can do and what they're trying to we want to update um, the first uh, objective of um, the stability of the currency because it doesn't really quite mean exactly how what we mean by that in a modern interpretation. So we want to update to, to be um, price stability. And that would mean that um, the bank would have a dual mandate of looking at inflation and uh, full employment. So... Um, then we would uh, recommend that we move to uh, economic prosperity as being in, um, that overarching thing. Uh, we have some recommendations to the statement on the conduct of monetary policy. We'd like to clarify that a little more as well. So um, people seem to like the 2 to 3%. Um, and But at the moment, the statement says that inflation should be 2 to 3% on average over time. So we would recommend that we take out uh, on average over time because it's a little bit uh, vague. We don't it, it's it define what on average and over time means. Uh, so we're looking more at um, uh, focusing on what at uh, the midpoint of that as well. I think there has been a, a little less emphasis on what the full employment mandate of the bank has been. And I think that's hard because it's harder to uh, explain. And full employment, it changes over time and, um, you know, things like how do we measure underemployment and all of those types of other um, measures of employment are harder to assess. But um, we would just like to see the bank give us their um, explanation of, of what they, they're thinking in terms of employment. Um, we would also like them to tell us in more detail when the bank is using their flexibility in uh, their inflation um, targeting framework. And more information on the factors influencing their decisions, such as financial stability. Uh, in terms of macro fiscal policy interactions, um, we want to make some changes to the statement so that it is really explicit that both monetary policy and fiscal policy are important for macroeconomic outcomes. So their policies affect both employment and inflation. So um, we don't want the RBA to be in a situation where their job is impossible because of what fiscal policy is doing. Um, we also think that it would be useful if the uh, bank and the treasury work together on joint scenario modeling. So um, they have an idea ahead of time of, of how they would both jointly react in the face of different types of shocks, which they would be um, modeling. We also think that it would be useful in the statements to have uh, set out what frameworks the bank could use uh, if they needed to use additional monetary policy tools in the future, like those unconventional policies. Um, it would be good if they could agree in advance on the transparency, their costs and benefits, how they might manage risks, what exit strategies there might be. And I, it would also be useful if they uh, had a discussion on the appropriateness of fiscal policy as an alternative policy lever instead of um, instead of the bank just necessarily using unconventional policies because they do have uh, fiscal um, implications. In terms of um, macro prudential and financial stability uh, relationships, um, we plan to, or we've recommended that we include that the RBA um, be responsible for financial stability in conjunction with other government agencies, and we would put that in the Act. That's not in the Act anymore, but it seems to be a fundamental um, thing that the bank does and uh, what people understand that it would like it to do. In terms of uh, working with the other agencies, um, we would like the agencies in the Council of Financial Regulators to update their memorandums of understandings and to take a, 
um, a joint responsibility to identify what gaps are in uh, in the regulation of the financial system. So each has a, like a, a distinct um, mandate, but we are worried that in this quickly changing world that we're in, that um, there may be some gaps opening up. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Renee. Um, so I'm just uh, quickly scrolling through all the questions that are coming through uh, Pigeonhole and just to sort of help guide um, both our um, contributors and participants, but also the audience. I thought what I would do is there's a couple of questions that are sort of coming through in the context of the recommendations made around um, the Monetary Policy Board. Um, and then a few issues that track to um, objectives and frameworks, if you like, underpinning monetary policy decisions, and then a a handful of other sort of one-off type questions. Um, and if possible, I would really love to get an opportunity to hear from uh, the panel around the implementation um, issues, which they called out as uh, as well in the report, but we'll, we'll see how we're going. So, so first to the issue of, um, of the board, the, the number one rated question, perhaps not surprising, is um, that um, Philip Lowe has said that the panel's um, con conclusions about the RBA board didn't fully resonate with him uh, because you, you you weren't in the boardroom. Um, and Gordon, I think in your comments, you sort of talked to um, a few issues and examples, if you like, of where um, certainly during the pandemic, the board did, wasn't involved in, in decisions. So that's one aspect of performance clearly. Um, but um, the question really is, you know, not in the boardroom, how did you inform and reach your, your decisions around board performance and the recommendations? So I'm happy to start, but Carolyn and Renee, please, uh, please come in uh, if I, my answer is deficient in many ways. Uh, so we, we didn't ask to be in the boardroom uh, because, frankly, we thought that if we did, or I, I thought if we did, then we, we might influence or change the discussion and the nature of discussion. When people think they're being uh, watched and assessed, then maybe they behave differently. What we did rely on was uh, very full and private conversations with all current board members, with many uh, previous board members, uh, governors, um, deputy governors, and assistant governors and senior staff members who presented at the board, uh, as well as all the board papers that we asked for, and also all the bank, all the bank uh, material uh, that was written internally within the bank. So we, we spoke with, with hundreds of people, and we had uh, in, in private conversations. So I think when we formed our views, we felt that we actually had uh, a, a, an accurate call on the issues that were raised. In, in no way are, are we, or is our intention to um, uh, talk negatively about the integrity or capability and ability of, of board members. We're certainly not in that space at all. What we really are interested in is what sort of board and how would a board operate to make it effective in the future. And the thing that we that we were struck by was actually the, the limited time that Carolyn talked about to actually go through the issues so on, on a number of occasions, just not the information provided to the board in sufficient detail to provoke them and, and engage them. So, and in some cases, the board not being the place where decisions were made. So just in terms of the information, can I go through another example? I talked about the yield, the yield um, target, but the, the bond purchase program is a big thing. And when you go through the material um, that you're looking for quite a, quite a detailed economic and uh, fiscal analysis of the impact of bond purchase programs, you're looking for analysis uh, sort of ex ante of uh, what are the interactions of a bond purchase program with the yield target. So if, you, if you're targeting, say, the, the four to 10 year part of the yield curve, then that's going to influence the one to three year element of the yield curve. And maybe you're going to have a faster exit from your yield target if you've got a bond purchase program. We, we were looking for that sort of risk analysis um, and it, we, we, we couldn't see that uh, in sufficient form in the board papers or in the board minutes or in the, the subsequent discussion. So if, you, if you're thinking about a board process for the future, what you want to see is actually uh, there's time, there's people who are going to be interested in it and engage and push on that sort of material and that the board has access to, to staff, a broader range of staff views on those things and can, and can have considered debate. 
So that, that, that's that's how we landed, Melinda. But C C Carolyn or Renee, please, please feel free. You yeah. were you you said a lot of what I would have said. Uh, I would just add that that we were very conscious of the fact that anything we said about the board would feel personal, and it was certainly not uh, the intention at all. In fact, you know, part of our implementation says that we should consider. Um, you know, having continuity by keeping the board members and thinking about how they should contribute. And so I think that just is the proof is in the pudding there. Uh, I don't think we would have said that if we had any other any particular issues. It, it was really about, um, you know, what what Gordon said, I think the time element, you know, that they, you know, going from 11 to eight meetings might sound like a very micro kind of comment. But I know full well, being part having been part of these uh, discussions and still am with the financial policy committee, just how how um, useful it is to reflect on the issues and have some time to ask questions, maybe get more analysis done before a decision is actually needed. And that, you know, the way their process is right now, uh, there's, there's just not enough time. It all happens on the same day. Um, and also the, the frequency of the data um, really doesn't doesn't give you enough or much each time to, to look at that's new uh, when the main economic <clears throat> economic data are quarterly and the inflation data are just only recently monthly. So um, I think finally, one of our objectives wasn't so much, um, aside from having a monetary policy board that would concentrate on monetary policy decisions and 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 uh, it, it was really in increasing the the clarity of who those people needed to be in terms of the skills matrix and also the transparency and openness uh, through which they were selected. And so I, I wouldn't lose sight of, of that part at all uh, because it could be very, you could very well end up with, uh, or still have chosen almost anybody or everyone who's on the board right now, just in a different process. And you know the, the knowledge that's required on the economic side I think Gordon said it, uh, the supply side, the labor side is going to be just so important going forward. Sorry, Renee, yes, yes something to add on? Oh, yes, um, I just I just wanted to um, emphasize the, the strategy side of monetary policy. So before we went into the pandemic, um, the board was provided with one paper on unconventional monetary policies. And then when it came to um, the time when they were needed, they, the policies that were actually implemented were different to the ones that were um, recommended. So it just says to us that we really would like people or the, the board to be thinking in advance of, of how they would react in these, these cases. And um, there was really no explanation as to why those um, those policies were changed as well. So it just it seems like there wasn't quite the information flows going across where they should be. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. I've got two other sort of hopefully quickish questions that relate to this sort of um, the board and then I wanted to turn, um, turn to the sort of objectives and the frameworks, if you, if you like. Um, and I'll give you both questions at once, if that's all right. The first, hopefully, is just pretty... Um, well, it's never straightforward, but I think it's probably one for you, Carolyn, which is around the number of seats on this new board that um, the RBA would have, two out of nine, and how that compares. The question is really saying that the RBA only have two out of nine votes, governor, deputy governor, um, and that that's low compared to other G10 central banks. So um, do you think that's a concern? Um, and the second one goes to appointments, which is um, that there'll be a, a panel consisting of the governor, the treasury secretary, and one other to select uh, or make recommendations on candidates for the board. And there's a question around who is that, you know, what is the, the, the third person in that panel? What do they look like, if you like? So perhaps, Caroline, first question for you and Renee or Gordon, second question for you. <laughs> that sounds like a very good split. Uh, we, we did talk a lot about that. And it can, it, you know, my view is that it can work um, in many different ways. Uh, governance uh, really, um, really is is about how clear uh, it is and and the process. And so, and so, what we decided we had a couple of decisions to take. Should we change that proportion? Should we increase the number of internals uh, to the to the RBA? And should we think about the role of the Treasury Secretary? And so, um, 
And so, uh, as you can see, we decided to keep it pretty much the, the same in, in that area. And I think it's because um, we feel that, that if you select the right people uh, who have the right knowledge and the right incentives in terms of accountability, uh, that that uh, the, the governor and this and the, and the deputy governor will be able to hold their own and and uh, good decisions will be made. Uh, we didn't see any compelling reason to make uh, more profound changes in terms of that composition. And with respect to the the treasury secretary, uh, we thought that given the importance of the issues related to the mix between monetary policy and, and fiscal policy that, that it was important that, that there was a, you know, a voice at that table. Um, but as you can see from our recommendations, we wanted to make it clear in the legislation and in the, the statement uh, that that voice was the voice of the Treasury Secretary as a person acting on behalf of uh, the RBA to meet its objectives and could not be directed by, by the Treasurer. Thanks, Carolyn. And the selection panel. You go ahead, Gordon. I, uh, I, I, we don't have anyone particularly in mind. I think the idea was that actually it's good to have a conversation with some other independent or other other person uh, on on that sort of issue. Uh, so it, it, it's just a, it could be. I, I, I'd suggest that uh, either Renee or Carolyn uh, should be one of the people uh, consulted uh, on, on, on as the third person. Uh, it, it's just it's just drawing on a wider base, showing that uh, you, you're open to. Um, it's not an insider game, and it's look, looking at a at a range of at a, at a range of options. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think um, that a lot of the messages that we were getting was that the process to become a board member was very not transparent and people really wanted a little more clarity around that. Yeah, thanks. So uh, it prob this probably won't surprise you, but um, one of the uh, uh, questions that's sort of popping up in a couple of different ways um, from the audience is uh, really about the objectives, I think, and the sorts of um, other indicators that you might have called out to have more prominence, if you like. And so not nominal income um, targeting, um, how do you think about that? And the other issues that are called out are um, household indebtedness and house prices and, and how they should or should not be sort of reflected and thinking through the review panel on, on those issues. And I'll take a big step back and wait for someone to jump forward into that meaty topic. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, I'll start um, with nominal income um, targeting. So we did look at a lot of alternative frameworks through uh, this process, and um, we didn't find compelling evidence to change from the flexible inflation targeting framework, um, mainly because it's really well understood. Uh, we're also recommending a lot of other changes. So we didn't necessarily want to do everything all at once, but we have opened the door for um, reviews of frameworks and other elements of monetary policy on a regular framework. Um, if someone needs to uh, sit down and, and put the evidence together if, if they think that there is a better alternative and um, maybe present that to the next uh, review. I guess some um, in terms of household indebtedness, uh, one of the one of the things about monetary policy in the 2016-19 period was um, concerns about financial stability coming from household indebtedness. And there was a lot of confusion around that. And so our recommendations are basically saying that if the RBA is concerned about financial stability for that reason, then they need to tell APRA and the Council of Financial Regulators um, with formal advice um, so that they can work together on how to best address those issues. I'm not sure if Carolyn or Gordon, you want to add anything. I would just say that it's it's also important to be really clear if you're using your flexibility to uh, lean against some finance, financial stability issue, whether it's or vulnerability, whether it's uh, you know really um, you know house price uh, increases that don't seem uh, sustainable or household indebtedness that that's getting to high levels, then then the first the first line of defense is going to be micro and, and macro prudential regulation and not monetary policy. There's a lot of evidence uh, that shows that that's that's less effective than these others, and in fact could be very costly in terms of jobs. 
and, and growth. And so um, that's not to say that it should never be used, uh, but certainly uh, it doesn't seem like the first line of defense in in the in the research that that we've seen. And if it were to be used, it would be it would be it. We've asked in the report that it's that it's um, used in a way that's very transparent. The reason we didn't call out necessarily housing, hold indebtedness and 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 uh, house prices per se is that they're not an individual target of monetary policy, and financial stability issues can come come about for other reasons, not just this. And so we 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 just put it under the umbrella of financial stability, but the intent was. Uh, to refer to that along with other potential vulnerabilities. Mm. Can I um, add, um, sorry, um, the financial stability or that, that indebtedness and housing prices may still be very relevant to the economic cycle and to where employment yeah. is and to where inflation is. So you can capture, often you can capture those dynamics in, a, in an economy if you're looking for stability over time. The, the risk of taking the matters as separate focus, uh, and Carolyn said we were very clear about not to do that. If you're focusing just on housing prices, you may, through through setting interest rates, you may have inadvertent and undesirable consequences for both price stability and for and for employment. And that's really, then you, you're getting, you, you can set off instabilities uh, and you can not meet your other objectives, but better to keep it focused on the price stability and the full employment dimensions, and you'll capture the, the things that really matter uh, in, in that from a monetary policy perspective, and it may be a fiscal or a regulatory or another policy that's actually most relevant to housing prices or to uh, indebtedness. Thanks, thanks all. Um, still on the on this sort of um, framework question, if you like, and objectives, um, I, and I think this goes to the issue that is addressed really clearly in the report around the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. There's a specific question around whether the review considered um, Roscano's call for an independent authority looking at overall demand and not just monetary policy, which I think is sort of saying how you think about the other levers of sort of macro policy and in thinking about that. Is that something that, that the review panel looked at specifically? I see Gordon and Renee both nodding. <laughs> no, we, did, we, did, we did discuss it. Um, in the end, we decided that it probably wouldn't fly anyway uh, politically because um, we didn't think that the governor, I mean, the, the 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 government would want to give away all of their powers in that way. But we have um, created quite a few avenues for much more coordination between the two. And we've also... Um, would like to see, I guess, some of these bigger issues that we really didn't have a chance to go too much in depth to be looked at in in future reviews. Because I mean, we 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 didn't have very much time to do this. We had about eight or nine months. Um, there was a lot to cover. Uh, there hasn't been a review before, uh, so we have left the door open for um, looking at those types of issues in more detail. Can I just add, uh, f f fiscal policy has not just a macro cycle dimension, but it has many aspects around equality and inclusion. And it has the nature of some of the drivers of growth and, and social stability in it. Th those, those issues are far from being just technocratic. They are social choices that are much, to my mind, uh, much better in the hands of politicians in a democracy who represent the interests of the people and, and that's, that's how we make those social choices. Uh, the thing that Renee highlighted is we've got so many other things now in train that are gonna have a lot more information and analysis to support decision-making. And, and frankly, to build up relationships between different parts of the, the, the policy apparatus and, and, and government. And, and that's the, 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 there's a big gain to be had from that. So start there. Uh, <laughs> Thank you and well answered. But we've gone to um, the power of the government and whatever. So now I'm going to ask this question before I come back to some of the financial stability questions. Uh, and the question is very direct. Exactly why should the government remove the power of the Treasurer to overrule the RBA's decision? Gordon DeBrower, that's a Dorothy Dixon for you. 
Yeah, well, thank you, Melinda. Uh, well, that, that power has never been used. It's widely seen as a as a nuclear option. So it's the thing that actually would blow up probably both a government and a central bank uh, if you used it. And ultimately, at the end of the day, if if there is the, if the government disagrees with the decisions of the Reserve Bank, Parliament is sovereign, and Parliament can, can intervene. So I, I I don't and and can can. And that's probably the better the better place to to address that. So I, I don't think we're losing anything around uh, make, making a an independent institution not subject to to um, to the political issues, uh, or um, but better done through through that mechanism. Thanks, Gordon. A um, couple of things that, that track back to the the comments around um, financial stability and. Uh, the first one is, um, do you believe that the Governor of the Reserve Bank should continue to chair the Council of Financial Regulators? Yes, uh, that's why we kept it the same. I, I think the, the, the advantage of the, of the Governor of the Central Bank doing that is just the fact that they have a, a global view of, of the financial system, a macro view of the financial system, and the currently uh, the analytical capacity to study it. Uh, in my financial stability class that I'm teaching right now um, at Princeton, I've actually given the students a couple of uh, articles that were written by RBA staff. And so that work is just so so important and, and others are, are drawing on it uh, within that community of the Council of Financial Advisors. Um, that being said, what's really important is that the committee doesn't change the end point of where that responsibility lies. So the governor is still responsible for monetary policy. The head of APRA is responsible for the macro prudential and the macro prudential tools. And so it's really a, the responsibility of that group is to interact in a way to discuss issues with respect to the financial system. As Fene said, to, to, um, to ensure that they feel responsible to identify gaps that occur in with the development of financial innovation, uh, non-bank financial intermediation, uh, those sorts of things. But uh, I think the governor is very well placed, of a central bank in general, is very well placed to, to chair such a committee. Thanks. And then the other question in this space, I think, is um, it goes to you, the recommendation to um, repeal the RBA's power uh, to determine the lending policy, uh, lending policies of banks, um, and um, I think that there's an interest in the thinking behind that, and and specifically um, then what levers are available to ensure that the banks are passing on uh, interest rate cuts to borrowers. Um, thoughts on that. So I guess starting off with, you know, what's what's the the thinking behind re repealing the RBA's involvement there, and and do you have any concerns about what the implications of that might be in terms of, um, you know, the uh, borrowers in particular? I think I think we decided uh, to remove that power because we don't think that the bank should be the institution to direct uh, lending. I think if that happens, then that should be a question for the government. All right, pretty straightforward. I would also note that anyone who's been reading the papers would uh, have picked up on the fact that the ACCC is perhaps also looking at what's happening uh, with, with interest rates um, and what's what's going on in terms of the transmission of uh, rate movements uh, to both um, uh, borrowers uh, and, and depositors. Um, we've probably got about 10 minutes left and I thought um, maybe we'd use it. There's one more question that's sort of moved up the votes, if you like, which is a pretty broad one um, that there's interest in. And then I thought we might hook back to this conversation around just a few more insights around how you see the implementation of this going forward noting um, the government's uh, response to, to the review. But the, the sort of high level question was, um, you know, what was the most, um, was there something surprising or the most surprising thing that you sort of learned on the way through um, your conversations and considerations in, 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 in the review process? I don't know if it's surprising, sorry. No, I don't know if it's ahead. surprising, but um, it was, 
every single person we talked to a lot of people every single person that we spoke to said we re- we respect the RBA we think they do an amazing job but this is where we think they need to improve and there was always just a, a really just, just strong belief in the institution so I think that was more striking for me than surprising I guess the surprising thing is I changed my mind on whether we should have one or two boards <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the honesty there, Carolyn. <laughs> okay, so I have to say that seeing, and it did surprise me, I was I was gobsmacked that when we talked about the two boards, uh, and this wasn't with my, my panel colleagues, it was people outside, uh, you know, the possibility, what we heard, what I heard a lot was, oh gosh, I don't know how we can how we can find enough people to to uh, be on these boards because you know there's not a lot of people in Australia that maybe could do that and it's like an extreme sense of modesty that I that I didn't understand because I've been on I don't know how many committees internationally I've interacted with I don't know how many uh, Australians all the Australians that we talked to uh, many highly competent people uh, that that I thought could at least be considered. And so I thought that what surprised me was this, what I felt was an underestimation of the depth and the breadth of the capacity in Australia to, to fund these two boards uh, in terms of really good people. Uh, I had two surprises, Melinda. Uh, what One was like Renee. When I started off on this, I, I thought that one board could do it. And when you looked at the, the, the needs of what do you do about monetary policy, and actually about governance and oversight, uh, I shifted during the process to quite a, to a strong view of the importance of two boards. So that, that surprised me. The, the other was around the in inflation target. I, I, I thought that two to three, maybe actually we'd end up in a two and a half or a two number or some other number, you know, a specific number. What really struck me in listening to people across the board was almost everyone was Two to three is really well understood in Australia, and it makes sense. And there's a huge advantage, actually, in not having a very specific number, but having a, a thick point or, a, you know, a, a, a two point something number that actually is really good. And also, if we're in a slightly, if we're in a higher inflation world, you know, it's going to be harder for central banks if we are in a high inflation world persistently on the supply side to get back to two, a, a two number or you know, two to three is, is, is more suited to maybe the times, but it actually still anchors inflation expectations and still gives you coherence and consistency. So the reason why we didn't go for a two to four was that everyone said, if you increase the number, then every time you get an inflationary shock, people will think you're just increasing your inflation target to meet, to meet that. <laughs> so I, I was really surprised. I, I was surprised at the strength of the two to three. Thanks. Uh, look, if I could just weigh in, just based on your comments earlier on, some of the things that you sort of outlined, Gordon, early, you know, in your opening comments about some issues that perhaps the the board wasn't fully engaged with um, during the pandemic, like just you know wearing a board governance hat, like that does that actually surprises me um, a little bit that um, you know really yeah. significant decisions, um, particularly on changes that can be difficult to unwind or. To sort of extract yourself from that. As you were talking, I kind of thought, wow, that's that's probably something I um, wasn't fully aware of, or, or wouldn't have thought had happened. Um, but um, you know, difficult times and challenging times. I promised I was going to talk about implementation, and I, I'm sorry, I've got one more question that, and it may use up all of our time. But given where we're at and how much attention this is getting in the um, in consideration at the moment, and Gordon, you know, kind of touching back on your comments about the, the different roles of fiscal policy in terms of equity and fairness and, and whatever else. There's a question here about how the Reserve Bank, um, and specifically, I guess this goes to the new the new Monetary Policy Decision Board, should be thinking about the distributional impact of monetary policy. So others may want to come in too. I, 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 it, every policy is about people. So the reason why we have an independent central bank is that so we have price stability and full employment, which matters really, really deeply to the the good lives of people. So I I think we always want to be really understanding and cognizant and and understand the implications for distribution from each policy. 
but that doesn't mean that a policy like monetary policy can be directed towards um, so in inclusion issues. The key thing is to be fully aware of it and, and know where the choices are and, and the options are. Again, with different instruments may have different distributional impacts and, and understanding that is really important. And then using other parts of public policy to address or ameliorate or lean in on them. Uh, so you can't solve everything with interest rates or, or, or with unconventional monetary policy. Um, I think there is a, yeah, there is a, so, so once you've chosen a particular framework for monetary policy, say flexible inflation targeting or nominal GDP targeting, price level targeting, then you know, how you achieve that target is going to have di distributional implications. And so, and so I think Gordon's right, you need to be aware of them. But when you are choosing a framework, uh, it's important that one of your criteria for thinking about which framework to choose takes into account the distributional implications inherent in that framework. And so just as an example, you know, a two to three inflation target is probably less um of a problem for the distribution of income than a higher inflation target because we know people on fixed income and people who are who are um, have fewer choices on the income side are are hit harder by inflation and we're seeing that today. Um, so so I think it should be in these five years reviews one of the many criteria that you think through when you choose a framework. I think also when you get to the part where you've hit the, the zero lower bound on interest rates and you're thinking about, or you're going to, and you're thinking about using these alternative monetary policy tools, that's when our recommendation that a good discussion happen with the fiscal authorities is really important because it's not just about efficacy of these tools uh, and, and relative to fiscal policy, it's that different fiscal policy levers will have very different distributional implications than say a bond purchase program. And so that's that would be the moment to really think about which way do you want to tackle this problem? Hmm. Renee, anything to add from you? Um, I guess just following on from, from Carolyn's point um, about where distributional issues uh, are affected through, through monetary policy is also that when we're using these unconventional monetary policies, um, they have implications for the bank's balance sheet, which then has implications for the dividends that the RBA would pay to the government. So before the pandemic, um, average um, dividend was about $1.7 billion that would be paid from the from the RBA to the government um, for use in the budget. And so that doesn't happen anymore. So it is really quite complex. Yeah, thanks. I think one of the other things that um, in the conversations I've been having with people actually that I, I think sometimes deserves, um, you know, a, a bit of focus too is that um, high inflation is actually really bad for people who spend most of their income. Um, and so if you're a, a low income household who, you know, actually spends a large part of your income on the purchase of daily goods and services, um, when inflation is, is, you know, consistently running at very high levels, the impact on your well-being and standard of living is actually really, really significant. And I think sometimes when we sort of talk about this in a, in a sort of aggregate or average sense, that the distributional consequences of high inflation itself are sometimes um, not given the emphasis that they um, might otherwise um, benefit from, if I could put it that way. Um, well, I knew we were going to, going to run out of time quickly. I, uh, I have said the word implementation a few times. Um, as someone who's done a, a couple of reviews in my life for different institutions, um, I did think it was very interesting, the, um, the focus and attention that went um, to um, the, how these uh, recommendations would be implemented, could be implemented. And I think if I could, I think it underscores the point that um, all of the panel members have made that um, this is um, a, an evolution, um, not a, a dis disruptive revolution of, of the Reserve Bank um, and its responsibilities and that of the board. Um, and that, that underli you know, underlying that is a really clear um, reflection and identification of the strength of the Reserve Bank of Australia and the respect with which it is held both here and, and overseas. And so... Um, a careful consideration of the evidence um, and feedback from so many stakeholders around how that 
um, can be, uh, the, the role of the Reserve Bank can continue to be strengthened and improved, but not sort of pointing a finger at them and saying that there is wholesale dramatic change that's required. And hopefully I'm seeing nodding that that's an accurate sort of reflection <laughs> of, of the sentiment. So I think um, more, more to be seen here in terms of um, next steps, but also just calling out that, <clears throat> excuse me, that, you know, having more regular reviews of the Reserve Bank um, will allow some of the issues that got called out in the questions and um, some of the ongoing challenges that we're going to be facing, you know, in our economy and as we look into a more complex and uncertain future um, can be dealt with through those reviews, which would be a really positive thing. So thank you um, to each of the panellists, one, for your work and, and um, contribution to the report itself and to your efforts to strengthen the Reserve Bank and um, therefore our economy, but also thank you so much for your participation today and your frank and honest responses to the questions that came through. For the audience, you'll get an email with a link um, to the video, but we'll also be looking to put it up on our website um, as soon as possible. Um, so for that link and also uh, for any information about our upcoming events, uh, cedar.com.au. Thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to catching up with you at a live stream or a face-to-face -face event soon.